Well, tonight I'm beginning a sermon series entitled The Last Week, based loosely on the book, a book of the same title published by John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Ford. I'm doing this because I believe that every Christian ought to understand the events as they are recorded in the New Testament describing the last week of Jesus' life. That as we draw near to Christ, our faith is made strong and we grow in our spiritual life. On Monday of Holy Week, as Mark tells the story, Jesus goes into the temple. He overturns the tables on which the money changers are exchanging coins and selling animals. He disrupts things to such an extent that no one in the temple can move at all. He's remembered as saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. And the impact of this is so significant that the chief priests and the scribes begin to look for a way to kill Jesus. Fearful of his popularity. Now the story as it's told here in Mark is remarkably similar in Luke and in Matthew. John retells the story in uh, a little different way and he tells it earlier. He tells the story earlier in Jesus' life and does, I think, some different things with it. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how John understands this event. We might do that at another time. And one of the things that fascinates me is that the Apostle Paul never mentions it in all of his writings. Paul never mentions Jesus going into the temple and overturning the tables. I'm familiar with about three different interpretations that I'd like to uh, share with you this morning, this, uh, this evening, and uh, comment a little bit on each. The first is an interpretation I'd kind of like to discourage you from adopting, but it was the one I learned in my earliest days. I think I was 14 or 15, and I was dutifully attending Bible study and youth group uh, at that age, and the person who was leading the discussion was someone I had a lot of respect and admiration for. And I remember him going through this text and explaining how in the cleansing of the temple, Jesus is devaluing Jewish worship and lifting up Christian worship. That it's the beginning of something known as Supersessionism. That the Christian church is superseding Israel as the chosen people of God. That promises once made to Israel are now transferred to the Christian church. Now, as a naive 14-year-old, I, I felt a little uncomfortable with it, but I really didn't have the intellectual ability to articulate why I didn't like it, why it troubled me. And I simply accepted it, because he was the person in authority, and he must be right. As I studied more and learned more, I began to find some reasons to disbelieve that interpretation. It began to dawn on me that when Jesus goes into the temple, 
when he challenges the practices there, he's really going as a member of the Jewish community. He's going to have a discussion with other members about the Jewish, of the Jewish community, about what it really means to be Jewish. So it doesn't make any sense that, that superseding would be going on here. And furthermore, if you look back through the Old Testament, you can find countless verses where the temple worship is criticized as not being what God wants at all. that what Jesus articulates in the cleansing of the temple is very much a part of Israel's traditions. He's not a stranger from the outside, but he's speaking a word that has always been a part of the Jewish faith. And there's one more convincing piece of evidence that I'd like to uh, put before you. <clears throat> The changes that Jesus advocates are changes that are eventually adopted by the Jewish community as a whole. In 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the temple, the system of sacrificial worship ends. They don't do it anymore. And most worship in the Jewish community has moved from the temple to the synagogue. And even if you go to a synagogue today, you will find a worship experience that is very similar to ours. Reading of the sacred text. An exploration of what those sacred texts mean in the conduct of life. So it doesn't make any sense that Jesus is superseding the Christian community in the place of the Jewish community. And I'd encourage you not to believe that and not to perpetuate that misunderstanding. Now, Christians and Jews do believe very different things about who Jesus is. And if you want to sit down and, and do some important reading, read the book of Romans. But you've got to read it from the beginning to the end to follow the argument. For there Paul goes to great lengths to explain how it is that a consistent and faithful God could do all that he did with the people of Israel and do what he has done in the life of Jesus. And how there is no contradiction there. There is no superseding there. It's a long book and it's a hard argument to follow. But at the core of our biblical tradition, there is not a rejection of Israel. One of my favorite writers is, uh, I, I tell you a story. Um, Martin Buber was a great Jewish theologian. And one day he was lecturing a bunch of Christian bishops and uh, Christian theologians. And they were talking about the similarities of our two faiths. <coughs> and at the very end of the lecture, someone got up and said, but, 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 we believe different things about Jesus. And Martin Buber acknowledged that, yes, that was true. And then he told this story. When Messiah comes, he says, the Jewish people will be filled with great joy and they will greet their Messiah with delight. The one they've waited for, for generations. And when Messiah comes, Christians will greet the Messiah with great joy and great delight. And there will be wonderful rejoicing among the faithful. And then someone's going to ask, So Messiah, could you settle something for us? Have you been here before or not? 
To which Martin Buber said, Martin Buber said with an impish grin, if he's any kind of gentleman, he won't answer. <clears throat> the urgency of that question will recede in the presence of God's glory. And when creation is fulfilled, the things that contribute to its incompleteness will fall away and no longer be important. Well, the first interpretation of Jesus in the temple is the idea of supersession, of super, uh, the Christian church superseding Israel. And I would encourage us not to think that way. The second interpretation is more of an economic one. And uh, it's sort of like this, that the belief is that when they're changing the coins in the temple, they're doing it at an unjust rate of exchange. It was not lawful to make an offering to the temple with Roman coinage. The Roman coins had the image of the Caesar on them, and for a faithful Jewish person, that was idolatry. Thou shalt make no graven images is one of the commandments. So in order to make a gift, you would be expected to take your Roman coin out of your pocket and exchange it for a Jewish coin. Some suggest that the exchange rate was not just and fair, that the temple leadership was taking advantage of the spiritual aspirations of a people by unfairly exchanging the coinage. And that the price of the animals for sale was far above market value. So Jesus is angry that the poor are being exploited a similar twist on this is the idea that the tables themselves are located in one particular part of the temple. Now, the ancient temple is a huge building. It's not a little Baptist church on the corner. It's about the size of six football fields. One of the wonders of the world. If you look at it, it dominates the whole city of Israel. And there was different sections reserved for different people. One of them is the court of the Gentiles. And it is the only place in that magnificent building where a non-Jewish person could go. And where it says, this shall be a house of prayer for all people, is in the court of the Gentiles. Some scholars suggest that what Jesus is angry about is that the only place available to the Gentiles has been taken over by this enterprise. And Jesus is angry because it is exclusionary. It's saying there's no place for you. We've taken your place for something else. A second interpretation of this story should challenge us to be an inclusive people, to be thoughtful about how we use our space. Do we inadvertently push people out do we send words to those who are not affluent that they do not belong, that they do not have a place among us? And if we do, we should stop. The last interpretation I'd like to share with you, and one that kind of got me excited, is comes directly from the book that I mentioned in the earlier part of this sermon. 
And Crossan and Borg suggest that we should look at the story of the cleansing of the temple in tandem with the story of Jesus' triumphal entry. You know the one we read on Palm Sunday? And right in between those two stories is this story of a fig tree. And Jesus walks by the fig tree, and it's not even the season of figs, right? Isn't that what Roseanne read? And he looks on it for a fig, and he doesn't find one, and what does he do? He curses the fig tree. By putting that story there, scholars argue, Mark is linking the triumphal entry to the cleansing of the temple, saying that what ought to be flowing from both institutions, the institution of government and the institution of the temple, is not coming. You see, when Jesus goes into the temple on, Palm, on the city on Palm Sunday, he's mocking the way an emperor would enter. They would come in with great pomposity to remind people that they had the power and that the people had to obey. And so when Jesus sneaks in on Palm, that Palm Sunday day, he's, he's mocking that. He's protesting that. He's making fun of the empire. And from that experience, he goes directly to the temple and he begins to mock and make fun of the religious institution because in his day, there were only two powers. There was the power of the empire, and there was the power of the temple. And both institutions were so embroiled in argument with one another, and, and in the maelstrom of their conflict, the enduring things were lost. So when Jesus overturns the temples, tables in the temple, he's asking us to focus on the things that matter most. That the worship of God should always be connected to the just behavior of God's people, and that if you sever at that time, you've done a horrible thing. Jesus is angry according to this interpretation because the tie has been severed between justice and the rituals of worship. I had an experience in my life in which uh, ritual was disrupted because it lost its tie to justice. And it's a good story to share with you on a Sunday when we're celebrating our reconciling ministries. Every year we have annual conference and uh, preachers go off to the annual conference as we have for generations. I've had about 30 years, I think, of annual conference. And one of the most important things we do is ordain new preachers. And a part of what the ritual of ordaining them involves something we call the historic questions. That is, we're all asked the very questions that John Wesley asked all of his preachers since the beginning of the Methodist movement. I hope you forgive me, I have forgotten them. <laughs> but there's one. And on that day, the bishop stood before the annual conference in all of his Episcopal finery, and these five aspiring candidates for ordination stood before us as well. And the bishop began the ritual of asking the questions and was going through them and he got to one that said, have you examined the doctrines of the United Methodist Church and do you believe they are in harmony with the scripture and will you teach them? Oh, it just warms my Methodist heart. And here were these five people Three of which said yes, <laughs> and two said no. And they shook their head as they said no. And there was this hush that fell over the thousand or so people in the room. 
we're all dumbfounded and shocked. We, we didn't quite know what to do. And, and what do you do when you don't know what to do? You just keep doing stuff. So the bishop went on and asked the next question. <laughs> Well, later at the end, there was an inquiry. Someone went and approached these two preachers and asked them what the meaning of no was. And they came before the body and explained. They said no, because they did not believe that what the United Methodist Church teaches today about gay and lesbians is in harmony with the Holy Scripture, and they would not uphold that. We approved them and ordained them, and they are now faithful preachers of the gospel. Sometimes you've got to disrupt ritual if it's severed from justice. And if we would be a faithful people to the living God, we will do what we can to make sure that this house of prayer never severs the tie between what we do and the way that we behave, that we are a place of welcome, a place of welcome for all. Amen.